A long time ago, when I became secretary of the Photographic Society, of which I was then a member, I decided that my exhortations to fellow members to participate in helping to fill the programme would be enhanced if I set them an example and filled an evening myself. I had no subject on which I could claim special expertise, but had, over the years, changed cameras fairly frequently, and at that time could claim to have owned some 40 different ones over a period of as many years. And so the idea of calling a talk, 40 years and 40 cameras, was born. In those days, projectors were referred to as lanterns, and the images were produced on lantern plates. Never having worked with these before, my initial efforts produced more cover glasses for the slides than usable ones. However, Perseverance produced examples from 40 different cameras, <coughs> together with a few extra, enough to fill an evening. The intention was to project a slide and use it as a notebook, to recount details of the camera used and any anecdote that came to mind. The evening was fortunately successful, and a visitor from another club who was present asked me to present the talk to his society. Following this, I was encouraged to include the talk in the Midland Counties Photographic Federation lecture list, and as a result, 40 Years and 40 Cameras was presented to over a third of the Federation's member societies, until it became impracticable due to the fact that three and a quarter inch lanterns became things of the past with the introduction of the more modern 2x2 two two slides. In converting the subject matter to 2x2 two two transparencies, some later cameras have been included, and the title accordingly amended to 50 years and 50 cameras. My first introduction to photography was during the 1914-18 war, when my father was serving overseas, and my mother thought that it would be a good idea to send him some snapshots. Accordingly, a visit to our local chemist, one George Green, produced a number naught brownie, into which he inserted a film. Then, in his wisdom, said that when this was finished, bring it back and he would develop it, but the little laddie could do the printing himself. This is precisely what happened. I still remember being told the glassy side of the paper to the dull side of the film. The exposure being made in a printing frame, in bright sunlight, until the, an image a little darker than desired was obtained. The self-toning paper then being fixed in a solution of hypo, washed and dried to produce the finished print. The quality of these slides may leave a lot to be desired but they have been produced from negatives found in odd corners and in some cases copied from old prints. However, let us start projecting our notebook. The first slide from the original number naught box brownie is a picture of my mother and our pet rabbit Frisky. This was taken in 1916. This 1917 snapshot of our wartime postwoman Mrs. Green, no relation to the chemist, was taken with the number two brownie that replaced the previous smaller one. This camera served the family for many years, and whilst I was at grammar school, a Kodak demonstrator showed how to develop roll films. So, from then on, I did all my own processing. On leaving school, I became an enthusiastic cyclist. Also, as many more, I started smoking. There was at that time a brand of cigarettes called Summit, which gave coupons that could be exchanged for gifts. As a result, I was able to acquire a rather well-made folding camera called an Ensign Greyhound, easier to carry when cycling than the box brownie. This shot of York Minster was taken with the Greyhound. 
A friend became interested in the ensign and it was exchanged for two coronet cameras that he had. One of these was exchanged for a vest pocket Kodak Series 1, the lens and F11 meniscus and the two-speed shutter, 25th and the 50th of a second. No prints or negatives from the coronets have survived, but this interior of St John the Baptist Church at Coventry was taken with the vest pocket Kodak. The length of exposure was probably around the two-minute mark. This interior of the Church of the Knights Templar at Temple Borstal in Warwickshire was taken with an Ensign Clito folding plate camera, quarter plate size, that is four and a quarter by three and a quarter inches. It had been acquired primarily for use as an enlarger, being fitted in front of a homemade negative carrier that was attached to a lamp house consisting of a large biscuit tin. The Clito was subsequently changed to a quarter plate ensign cameo camera, having a 6.3 anastigmat lens made by Aldis. The second coronet camera was changed for a number two folding brownie, though no examples from this have survived. It was, however, itself changed for a new coronet self-erecting camera that had just come onto the market. It produced this record of the annual cyclist memorial service at Meriden in 1934. The vest pocket Kodak was upgraded, giving place to a vest pocket Ansco with a 6.3 lens and a three-speed shutter. In 1935, the late Henry Russell, who wrote as Minicam in the photographic press, extolled the virtues of a new Ensign Midget camera that had just come onto the market. It was extremely small and took its own special roll of film. This example shows the floodlighting of Birmingham Cathedral on the occasion of the Silver Jubilee of King George V and Queen Mary. Another camera that seemed far advanced at the time was a quite nicely made miniature called a Foth Derby. It had, for those days, a very fast lens, f3.5, and a focal plane shutter. It used vest pocket size film and gave 16 exposures on the normal 8 exposure roll. Ensign brought out a very neat self-erecting 120 size model. I well remember cycling in the pouring rain to this meet at Fenny Compton. It seems to be the only record made with the cell fix that remains. Another change of plate camera resulted in the possession of a 3.5 by 2.5 Ensign Cameo with an f4.5 Ross Tessa lens. The next development resulted from a visit to an exhibition of the still fairly new Leica photography. It was most impressive and turned attention to the 35mm format as a serious contender for consideration. In those days, £18 for a Leica was beyond my means, but the 35mm Perkio was obtained on APRO from Wallace Heaton. It was not found to be suitable, but they then supplied a Kodak Retina 1 with a 3.5 ectile lens and a compass shutter. This proved to be an excellent introduction to 35mm photography. There was still room for the larger 3.25 by 2.25 format though, and the Ensign Selfix was changed for an Ensign Auto Range, a folding roll film camera with a coupled rangefinder. The Cameo plate camera was changed for a very thin and extremely portable 3.5 by 2.5 Venus wafer, having a 3.5 mm triplan lens and a compass shutter. This was in 1939, and with the outbreak of war, outside photography was viewed with considerable suspicion. It seemed improbable that the hobby could be pursued with any degree of satisfaction. 
I accordingly packed up all my equipment and forwarded it to Wallace Heaton, with whom I had an account, and I asked them to hold the value to my credit until such time as I could resume my interest. In the following year, I was moved to Somerset to assist in the maintenance of the radio station at Burnham-on-Sea. It seemed possible there to indulge to some extent in one's hobby, so a new camera was sought. Wallace Heaton sent first of all a reflector twin lens reflex, then a Voigtlander Brilliant, neither of which seemed desirable. So I settled for a Thornton Picard Junior Reflex Plate Camera, a very bulky instrument, but as I was not contemplating carrying it about, it was accepted. By 1944, I'd become associated with the YMCA Snapshots from Home scheme and was looking for a more portable camera. The first obtained was a Salex Focal Plane Press Camera, taking three and a half by two and a half plates. The next that I was able to obtain was a Vest Pocket Kodak Series 3 with a 5.6 anastigmat lens. This picture was taken with it and shows the way we travelled around in those days. Tandem for my wife and myself, sidecar for our son, and if you notice by the wheel of the sidecar a black shape with ears, this was our Scottish Terrier Smokey who travelled in the basket affixed to the front of the tandem. Quite okay whilst the dog was dormant, but if awake and excited by surrounding activity, a certain amount of consternation could be caused among passers-by, who were obviously not accustomed to such unusual sights. About this time, one of the naval personnel at the radio station offered to sell me a Russian Fed camera that he had acquired. And as 35mm film was the only material readily available during the war, I accepted the offer. My first experiments may be worth mentioning, for I was given two cassettes of Russian film with the camera, and I happened to have some fine grain developer containing Meritol. Having no developing tank, I elected to seesaw the film through the developer and fixer in total darkness of the blacked out bathroom, my wife giving me timing instructions from outside. I had reckoned without the film. It was like clock spring. I never encountered anything like it before, nor have I since. However, after a struggle, I was able to secure some results. But a little later, brown spots were discovered everywhere. Face, shirt and trousers, not to mention the bath, which took hours to restore to its normal condition. Meritol proved to be one of the worst staining developers that I ever encountered. I mentioned snapshots from home. This is a copy of a postcard print with the YMCA identification card attached. The negatives were passed, were passed to the lady's son after the war, at his request. The idea of the scheme was to provide a service to supply those serving overseas with a pictorial connection with their families. As can be seen, I always endeavoured to include as much of the home surroundings as possible. In 1944, I was happy to see one of my pictures reproduced in the amateur photographer. It gave me the incentive to submit some prints to open exhibition. The first attempt was rejected, but the picture here was accepted at the Port Talbot Open Exhibition in 1945. In the last year of the war, we returned to Birmingham and I joined the Birmingham Photographic Society. At one of the Society's meetings, a lecturer discussed what he called the MELD technique, the initial letters representing a, miniature, uh, a minimum exposure and long development of the film. 
a technique pioneered by the American photographer Mortensen. The technique seemed particularly suited to child portraiture, in which I was interested, for quite good modelling could be obtained using completely flat frontal lighting. The 35mm format seemed rather too small for this process, so search was made for a more suitable camera. This was taken with a vest pocket exacto reflex. The next camera that was tried was a reflector twin lens reflex, two and a quarter square. It didn't prove satisfactory for portraiture, but was taken on holiday, and the original of this very poor reproduction found favour in competitions. A delightful little plate camera, six by four point five centimetres, was a Contessa Natal that did produce reasonable results using the MELD technique. One of the early Japanese imports was a little 35mm called a Lira. It possessed one of the poorest lenses that I ever encountered. I paid five pounds for it, a fair sum in those days. I was so disgusted with this camera that I put it in the camera club's annual bring and buy sale. And I was horrified when the Lira was auctioned and sold for eight pound. I felt so uncomfortable that I offered to buy it back for the price paid. However, the gentleman concerned was quite happy with his acquisition and subsequently gave it to his child. One of the cameras tried when looking for a bigger format was an ensign roll film reflex, taking 120 size films. It had the disadvantage that if the film was wound on following each exposure, the normal method, the film tended to drift out of the focal plane, with the result that much of the image was out of focus. It was an accidental asset in the case of this picture, entitled Young Adventure, for it created an ethereal feeling that found favour with judges. If the film was wound on immediately prior to releasing the shutter, there was no problem, as this record of Bosom Church in Sussex shows. The definition here is quite satisfactory all over. One of the interesting instruments that I came across was a half-plate stand camera made by Thornton Picard. I converted it to use three and a half by two and a half plates. It is of interest that the definition of the rapid rectilinear lens compared favorably with even modern anastigmats. This copy of a television set circuit provides some proof. An interesting low-cost 35mm camera that utilised its own special film cassettes was an Agfa Carrot. Incidentally, this picture, taken early one morning in the Birmingham Park, was made from a negative that had been physically developed, a somewhat involved process that produced exceptionally fine-grade negatives. As a matter of interest, the little figure strategically placed seemed to need accentuating. So on a print submitted for a club competition, this was duly attended to, whereupon the judge commented that he would have preferred this accent to remain as it in fact appears on this slide. On another occasion, when the print had been amended in accordance with this criticism, the gentleman adjudicating said that the darkening of the figure would provide just that little point of interest that would enhance the composition. Seems you cannot be right all of the time, and it's a matter of chance whether you'll get it right for the occasion. This was procured with another Thornton Picard reflex, called in this case a ruby. Again, three and a half by two and a half inches. That's the negative size. By today's standards, this was an enormous piece of equipment, being a cube of some 9 to 10 inches, without the focusing hood being extended. In 
Usually I used to carry about was a little Canadian-made Kodak Bantam, which took its own special film, <clears throat> number 126, if I remember correctly. In 1951, I was able to afford my first Leica, a Series 2 with a 3.5 Alma lens. This picture that I called Nautical Lines was taken at the Festival of Britain exhibition that was held that year. By 1953, I had added a 150mm trinol lens. This was a British-made objective made by the Leicester Optical Company. And for a long time, I was very happy with my equipment. Then things began to go a little wrong. And it was whilst attending a meeting of the London Camera Club as a guest that one of their members suggested that the trinol lens could possibly have affected the rangefinder coupling of the Leica. And the upshot was that in 1955, I decided to part with the camera and associated equipment. And I wrote to three London firms, asking them to suggest an exchange allowance subject to inspection. Two refused to quote without the inspection, and one made a tentative offer of £50. I decided to take a trip to the metropolis to see what could be done. Starting with the Westminster Camera Exchange on Westminster Bridge, they inspected the goods and regretted they were not prepared to make me an offer. My next call was City Sale and Exchange in Cheapside, one of the Wallace Heaton chain. They made me an offer of £35. R.G. Lewis in High Holborn raised this to £40. It was then that I made my way to Dolan's in New Bond Street, the one firm that had, in fact, uh, offered me, uh, made me an offer by post. The manager took the camera and the trinol lens, and after examining them, said he was not interested in the Albada finder and Leica cassettes that I had included, but was quite prepared to offer me the fifty pounds against any other equipment that I cared to take. On returning to Birmingham, I sold the items that were not taken for a further £8. So from the first quotation of 35 we had added another £23 to make a total of 58 It seemed that a lot depended on what second-hand goods were in fact held in stock by any particular firm as to what they were prepared to take uh, and the figure that they were prepared to offer. I left Dolan's on that occasion with a twin lens reflex, an Icaflex, which gave a lot of satisfaction and provided a change from 35mm work. Always interested in photographic shops and those dealers that had second-hand equipment for sale, resulted in the purchase of another Agfa Carat camera. It was very cheap, £2 if I remember correctly, but it wasn't working. And the dealer said that he thought it might have been dropped in the sea. I was interested, so took it home and completely dismantled it. After cleaning and lubrication, the reassembled carrot proved quite capable of taking acceptable pictures. Incidentally, this was taken on a club evening outing and the member in, uh, included in the picture subsequently left the club. It was a couple of years later when giving this talk to another club that someone called out, That's our Mr Thomas! And it seemed that the gentleman having moved to another district had found himself a new camera club. My photographic society received an invitation to attend a circus performance and by chance I spotted uh, an Edixa camera in a window at a reasonable price. It had a larger aperture lens than I possessed at the time, so I acquired it. The Edixa was a queer looking instrument and surprisingly ungainly for a small camera, so I quickly changed it for a retina. Uh, Retina 1, which I retained until on holiday, 
when this was taken. Then, at a camera shop, I spotted a mentol folding reflex. I had always wanted to try one of these, but on examination found that the shutter was faulty. The dealer, who had previously shown no interest in the retina, was now prepared to do business, and the reflex changed hands. I very soon repaired the shutter and gratified my desire to try the camera. No negative from it could be found, however, when preparing these slides. My son wanted his own camera, so we obtained another ensign midget that pleased him for a time. <coughs> then he wanted something bigger, so we found a number two folding brownie. He then decided that he wanted to play with Cine. So both the cameras gravitated to my stock. Deciding to return to 35mm size, I disposed of the Icaplex for a Packset 1M. This was taken during an outing on London South Bank with members of the United Photographic Postfolios, a postal club of which I was a member. At the same time that I purchased the pack set, I came across one of the nicest 35 x 2.5 plate cameras that I ever encountered, a Kodak Rekomar. It was ideal for what was known as glass top photography, pioneered by the late E. Hyman. It could provide many hours of interest in picture making. This effort we called Abyss Crossing. A little camera that was handy to carry around was the Voigtlander Vito, a very compact 35mm that slipped into the pocket. This record of a bus that had stranded itself in the sand at its turning point was obtained just as the breakdown crew had arrived to free it. An inspector accompanying them volunteered the information that this was no, not an infrequent happening. It seemed that if the driver was scheduled for an extra journey that he wished to avoid, it was very easy to lose sufficient time and be too late for the unwanted trip. A very popular two and a quarter inch square single lens reflex in the 1950s was called the Reflex Corel. One was used for this little picture entitled Sunlit Corner, taken on a club out into the Cotswold. The lady in this slide was well into her 80s when the picture was taken. It was secured with an early Ronicord camera. Another model, a Ronicord 2, was used in this case. All the twin lens reflexes were popular at the time and had been for many years. A trip to London to dispose of some unwanted cameras and equipment resulted in the acquisition of a Retina 2 camera obtained at Brunnings in High Holborn, a firm that seems to have long since gone out of business. In 1962, the Practica began to make a name for itself as a reliable, popular price 35mm reflex. This table top was taken with one. By 1964, earlier Rolly cords had given place to one of the last to be produced, the 5A. The 35mm was already becoming almost universal. So, so, although some of us persisted in retaining contact with larger formats. This dismal scene on Barton Broad in Norfolk reminds me of a Leica 3C that had a short trial, but the shutter was found to be step wedging. That is, the negatives were darker one side than the other due to the malfunction of one of the blinds of the focal plane shutter. The 3C was replaced by a 3G, with which this picture was taken. The 3G gave way to a Leica M2, but that was subsequent to the period covered by this collection. The ownership of a Rihok 35mm automatic was very short, for it proved somewhat erratic, and was changed for a similar sort of instrument called a Kanaika. 
This is a reminder of a 35mm X-Acto reflex. The X-Acto was actually the first of the 35mm reflex cameras and they maintained a good standard over many years. The last twin lens reflex that I owned was one of the last models of the Rolleiflex, an excellent piece of equipment. And in many ways we old fogies regret the almost universal uh, use of the 35mm format. Though, like most, we have succumbed to the convenience, one sometimes wonders. My excuse was standardisation. In 1973, I decided to use 35mm entirely and I purchased a Pentax SV to replace the Rolleiflex. This has been superseded by a Pentax ME Super, which provides me with the means of copying and is suitable for tabletop work and still life, also invaluable for natural history subjects. It proves a useful companion for my Leica M2. For a time, I used a Mamiya U that I could slip into my pocket. This was later changed for a Pentax AF, but these later cameras have no place in this collection. There are, however, one or two other cameras that have been used over the years. This was taken with a Kodak Instamatic 300 that I bought for my wife. She had a lot of pleasure with this excellent little camera though the flash facility was an undoubted weakness. An automatic Fuji that she tried was not so successful, nor did we like a Kodak 110 that is still looking about somewhere. A Kodak Instant Camera and a Polaroid 600 still find opportunities that suit their ability to produce results on the spot. I cannot resist including this copy of a print made by my son in his early teens, largely because it was taken with a little box camera that was presented free some years ago to readers of a national paper. We never managed to get a film through the camera without it sticking, but it could still produce rather lovely pictures. In the same way, a portrait taken with an ensign full view for a club box camera competition produced a somewhat more sympathetic study of childhood than one taken at the same time with more sophisticated equipment. This is the other one taken with the Kodak Rekomar plate camera previously mentioned. The anastigmat lens certainly gave wonderful definition but failed to produce the soft feeling of early childhood that was achieved by the simple box camera. In making the slides for this talk, a few more I included that were taken with cameras already mentioned. I couldn't resist including this that I called Peeping Tom when I gave the talk at Coventry. Incidentally, this was taken at the bottom of my father's garden overlooking some tennis courts, when the ladies had just started wearing shorts, a really startling innovation in those days. When visiting the Birmingham Photographic Society, I included this shot showing three past presidents of the Midland Counties Photographic Federation on an outing. Two of them were members of the Birmingham Society. One of the bronzes at the Birmingham Hall of Memory, the last exposure that I made with the Fed camera that I used during the latter years of the war. A rather beautiful rude screen in the church at Knoll in Warwickshire, taken with one of the early plate cameras. Humour of a sort, a Leica shot at London Zoo. Well, beauty life but skin deep, so we call this one Deep in Beauty. Humour of another sort. The Leica was ideal for taking a quick series of pictures, in this case four frames. Big Brother tries to amuse his sister by pulling faces. She certainly seems interested. But the amuser himself becomes amused and sister doesn't seem impressed. In fact, 
not only bored but apparently disgusted. A friend's corgi dog taken with a practica contrasted the rough cast wall with the smooth coat of the dog. Watch me, mummy. A three and a quarter inch slide of this was accepted in the Photographic Alliance exhibition in the late forties, taken with a Thornton Picard reflex camera. Another slide that the Alliance accepted around 1950. In the course of this natter, you've heard something about over 50 cameras covering a span of as many years. To the best of my memory, the reminiscences are true. But should you feel an element of fantasy? This final slide, entitled Nocturnal Fantasy, may serve as a fitting termination. It is, in fact, another glass top photograph taken with the Rekomar plate camera. I sincerely hope that this trip down memory lane may have proved nostalgic to some and of interest to others.